only chance you've got is both of you. Ant-Man and the Wasp teaming up. Follow my lead. I'm Danielle Costa. I'm the VP of Visual Effects for Marvel Studios. I work on all the movies that we have currently in production, um, helping guide the visual effects teams and help them as needed for all the films we have in production. I've been at Marvel Studios since 2009. I started on Thor 1. And then worked on Avengers. And has subsequently worked on every film we've made since then. This, I think, is a really beloved character, Ant-Man, and what was really cool about this particular movie, it's the first time a female heroine got her name in the title of the film, The Wasp. As much as this movie is about Ant-Man, I think personally it's also about the Wasp as well. She really came to life in a totally different way and we saw a whole other side of Hope Van Dyne in this film than we had in the first film. Originally they had come up with a design that was a little bit more like a dragonfly. Ultimately we landed on something more techy because it really had to feel more reflective of something that could have been created and something maybe less organic than the dragonfly look had been. The visual effects team always wants to be sort of um, the illusion that you don't know or kind of like a magician how you don't want it to be an obvious trick you want people to be just swept away from the story and everything that they're seeing is completely believable in a movie like this where you're going small where you're going large where you're integrating crazy live action photography with crazy CG it has to all feel like it's working all in the same universe while it may seem to be easier to build visual effects into plate photography, in a way it's actually just as difficult as having a fully CG rendered shot because you have to be able to convincingly integrate live action photography with CG elements artfully in a way that people will believe that it's all in the same lighting condition and they're not going to challenge it. Eyes. At the beginning of the film, there's a scene that takes place in the 80s when Hank Pym and Janet Van Dyne are younger and they are saying goodnight to their young daughter. And little do we know that this is going to be the last time that young Hope is ever going to see her mother until, of course, the end of the movie. We've um, shaved as many as 20, 30, 40 years off of actors over the course of the Marvel Cinematic history. The technique of uh, youngifying actors. Essentially what we do on set is we dot up the actors' faces so that they have points of reference for tracking and then re-sculpt and reshape the face to make them seem uh, younger. The kitchen restaurant scene is probably the first time that we really see the wasp in action at her fullest capacity. They pulled out the Fraser lenses which can do infinite depth of field and a lot of the surfaces and a lot of the kitchen environment was shot using this particular methodology. It was shot where one of the goons throws the knife at her. So that was shot at a high frame rate so that we could really take full effect of the dramatic throw. The, the stunt actor did the motion of throwing, but in the end, the knife itself is CG and of course her acrobatic maneuvering around the knife is all CG as well. Obviously, the wasp is CG. When they're bashing on the tomatoes and the tomatoes are exploding, that you know table surface is CG, um, or the extension of it is CG, and the tomato is CG. So um, it was a it was a really well put together blend of live action, seamlessly integrated with um, a CG environment and CG animation and CG characters. The fight scene in the lobby it's the first time we see Ghost there would be a hero take on her performance, but the visual effects facilities would take all of the other takes that were surrounding it that weren't maybe the hero take um, used and use that to anticipate or follow the actual solid version of Ghost. For me personally, the reason why I love that scene so much is the first time we get to see Wasp being like the total badass that she is. The interior 
Weather Lab was built on a soundstage in Atlanta, which is where principal photography happened. Uh, AA batteries that had been scaled up in the backgrounds to imagine that like Hank was fueling the entire lab off of these, you know, tiny little AA batteries that he had blown up. The good thing about ants is that there's lots of reference about how they move, how they walk. They've been there's lots of photography available online to know really how how their movements work. For example, there's a scene where uh, Dr. Bill Foster is surrounded by the ants and he just acted that out as if they were there, and then Cinecite put the ants back in after that. There it is. There's a breach. There's a scene at the end of the movie where Ant-Man needs to follow the bad guy to go get the lab that he had stolen. So he goes out into the bay. He's using so much energy as giant man that he can barely keep himself together. And then he falls back into the water. And it's, it's a comic scene, it's really funny. I think that scene from a story point of view is really important, a lot of that scene ended up getting replaced digitally just to make it feel as integrated as possible. So some of the water that he interacts with is, is replaced. The skies are all replaced. Um, he's a full CG character. In reality, if you've ever been swimming in the Pacific out, off of California, you know that it's a very murky type of water. It's not like the Caribbean. You can't see very far. And so I think they did a good job at showing how murky it was. I think if it was true to form, you probably wouldn't have seen anything. But what I, I think is funny about that particular shot is how much detail that they built, how much of the bay they built, how much of his suit, and how much they rendered in all of that. And then in the end, they kind of did a wash, deleting all of that great details because you wanted to give it the you know realistic quality of feeling like the murky Pacific Ocean that's outside of San Francisco. The important thing when Scott is bigger, when he's small, to keep in mind is to make sure that his movement and his animation reflects the scale that he's at. It adds to the feeling of like a ginormous character and when they're tiny, like an insect, they can get around and, and move quicker. So when the animation teams tackle either Giant Man or Ant Man, they have to keep in mind um, not just scaling their movements in base, but also to scale their movements in terms of time. This is a scene where Luis is traveling through the streets of San Francisco and he gets shrunk to matchback size. The shot where he's coming down the street is one of the uh, few shots in the film where we actually did use a Fraser lens on a car and uh, rolled it along the, the edge of the, um, of the street to get the background plate uh, reference that we needed so that we could feel that the street surface was actually, you know, Ant-Man size and that you, as an audience member, had gone to Ant-Man size as well. In the case of the dive into the quantum realm, you have to convincingly show in a photorealistic way a dimension that, of course, one could never experience in real life. The teams took great care to figure out all the different levels of the quantum layer. So first, um, you go through a bacterial level, which we call the tardigrade level internally. The thing about the tardigrade level is that there is reference for that in the real world. We are able to do microbial probes um, in the bacterial level, and we do have a sense of what those things look like, where you can see you know, these big shapes of tardigrades surrounding Hank and his pod. He never said it was so beautiful, Scott. So in this scene, uh, Hank has just arrived at the most sub-subatomic level of the quantum realm and he's starting to explore what this crazy world looks like. He's just arrived, he's disoriented to a degree, and he's trying to get his bearings, and he's very hopeful that he's gonna find his wife, Janet, down here. The textures of the quantum realm were animated using prismatic light spectrum, and they got a lot of inspiration from coral reefs and various like electron microscopy. I think they looked at virus microscopy and saw what the vibrant, you know, colors could be from there and built it into a moving uh, plane of textures. And then they applied that texture on a moving and fragmented topography. You're meant to feel uncomfortable to a degree about this crazy landscape and this wacky world. I still feel like we're continuing to improve, be better. The feeling around the office is how can we be better? How can we tell better stories? 
How can our visual effects be the best visual effects in the world? I love my job. I would never want to do anything else or work anywhere else.